Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 29 of the Joe Cannon Health Podcast. I'm exercise physiologist Joe Cannon, back for another week where we talk about exercise, health, fitness, nutrition, myth busting, wellness, and all things to help you stay on target and keep living your best life. Before we go further, I want to first say thanks so much for all the positive feedback I had last week with my interview with Alexandra, who talked about what it was like to have rhabdo and thrive afterwards. One of the reasons I wanted to do a podcast was to actually call attention to exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis, something I've been investigating for over a decade and quite passionate about. I wanted to basically give people a voice who've had rhabdo and also highlight uh, what this phenomenon is like and also um, basically discuss you know, that it happens more often than I think most people think. Based on that episode, I've already started getting emails from people out there uh, who've had this disorder, and it only kind of confirms my suspicions that, again, this is something that I don't think is on a lot of people's radar. So if you enjoyed uh, my interview with Alexandra Fesco last week, you will not be disappointed because I'm going to do other interviews with other rhabdo sufferers in the future. So definitely stay tuned for more on that. But for this week... We're going to turn the tables a little bit and turn our attention back to heart disease, specifically lowering cholesterol levels. But this week, I want to look at it from another angle that you may have not heard about before. And I'm going to keep you in suspense for a moment because before we get into all that, let's talk about, you guessed it, the myth of the week. And this myth comes to me actually through a question I was asked just the other day, and it was, do you need to give your liver a rest? I was talking to somebody recently, and basically he had said that he was doing uh, intermittent fasting a couple times a week because he wanted to give his liver a rest. And I, I thought about it for a minute, and I basically said, well, in reality, your liver really never does take a rest, and we really wouldn't want it to. The liver is constantly working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for our entire lives. And so it, it's not really necessary to give a break through doing intermittent fasting. The liver is pretty much uh, good to go on its own in terms of giving itself uh, a cleanse or a detox. And that's another reason why people tend to want to give the liver a rest. They think it needs to be periodically cleansed or detoxed. And again, one of the ways they'll do this is by doing, say, intermittent fasting, you know, once or twice a week or something like that. Or maybe they'll take some dietary supplements that may do this as well. But in, re in reality, you know, the, the liver, the kidneys, you know, our whole gastrointestinal tract, even our microbiome do a pretty darn good job at detoxifying us every day. You know, so I, I just don't think it's necessary to give your liver a rest or detoxify it with fasting or different dietary supplements. What I would say is if you're looking to detox your liver uh, and even detox the body or cleanse the body, if you will, you know, there's a couple of easy ways to do this would be, for instance, you know, exercise, simply taking a walk, you know, for, you know, a few times a week, half an hour a day, whatever, whatever you're able to do, get in a pool, warm water pool, you know, any kind of movement is going to do a really good job on detoxing the body as a whole. But some other things that may give your liver a rest, and I'm using air quotes when I say that, would be eating better class of foods, you know, more fruits, more vegetables, more colorful foods, if you will. Um, they contain a lot of antioxidants and other nutrients that the body can use to stay healthy. Drinking more water is a great way to keep, you know, keep your body hydrated. And, and again, the blood in the body is mostly made of water. You know, the human body is about 75% water, more or less. So again, the more, more water we have, the better able to we're flush these toxins, whatever they may be. I'm again using air quotes from the body. Um, and again, going in hand in hand would say eating more fruits and vegetables, you know, eating less things that come in cans and boxes, you know, and got wrappers around them. You know, I was actually looking at my, my cupboard the other day and I found uh, some canned soup 
that was it has basically been in my cupboard for at least three years that I can think of. And then I thought some, I thought to myself, gee whiz, how long has it actually been uh, on the shelf of the store before it somehow got purchased? But regardless, you know, if it comes in a can or a box or a package, it's highly processed, which means it's got a lot of preservatives and things like that, which can in turn make your liver work a little bit more harder uh, to get rid of some of the other things that maybe you don't need. So at the end of the day, detoxing the liver is not super duper hard. It usually means eating better foods, eating less sugar, uh, less, less high fructose corn syrup, more fluids, more water, moving more. And your body's pretty good about taking care of itself. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense because human beings have been on the earth for, let's say, about a half a million years. Archaeologists don't hold me to that. But we've been around a long time. If we really need to periodically detox through either supplements or you know fasting or something like that, we would probably would have died out a long time ago. So I don't necessarily think giving a liver rest is necessary. But if you want to do it through fasting a couple times a week, I think that's okay. But I just don't think it's uh, ne a necessary evil you need to be doing. Your body is pretty good on its own. So I'm going to call this one a myth. Um, if you have other thoughts, definitely shoot me an email. If you've ever seen any research on this, shoot me an email as well. But I'm going to call it a myth for now. And let's move on. So if you were to skip back to episode 24, that's where I gave you several ways to lower your cholesterol levels naturally. This week, I want to expand on that conversation by talking about something you may not be familiar with. It may, have, may not be on your radar. I don't think it's on most people's radar. And that's about potentially natural ways that you might use to lower levels of something called PCSK9. PCSK9. So, if you've never heard of PCSK9 before, you're in really good company. Again, I don't think most people have heard of it, but I think maybe this, perhaps, maybe something you've seen advertised on TV or advertised uh, on online. Um, there are some drugs that are marketed to lower PCSK9 levels, and this in turn, it is said, will lower the risk of heart disease. So, before we go any further on this topic, uh, I want you to know that this is really, really complicated, and that is an understatement. I'll link to some studies in the episode notes so you can take a look at them if you want. Um, I want to take as much of this E equals MC squared stuff, all this con you know, this sciencey stuff, out of the equation as much as I possibly can. And I'm basically going to assume that you're hearing about this for the first time because I think that's going to serve your needs best. I also, or rather I want to put the emphasis on the research on lowering PCSK9 levels naturally. And, and I want to do that because I think that's going to help you best figure out if any of the stuff we talk about today is right for you. And, and I want to bring it up because, again, this is getting a lot of publicity in terms of some medications, and there are some supplements that are reputed to lower PCSK9 levels. I'm going to talk about a couple of them today. Again, I want to put the emphasis on the research so you can get a better idea of whether or not this is right for you. Again, we're talking about some pretty weighty stuff, and so I'll just say it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on TV. So if you want to follow up with any of this stuff, I think your best bet is to talk about it with your doctor. I know doctors know a lot about this PCSK9 stuff because it is, uh, is a med there's, there are medications out there that will lower it, and it is a very hot topic in medical research. So I'll point you to them, and uh, again, you can talk all this over with, them, with those. But I want to give you, again, a summary idea, if I can, of what all this PCSK9 stuff is, and again, really try to drill down on some of the diet dietary supplements that may be touted to lower PCSK9 levels naturally, again, for those who may not want to take a medication. So let's first recap the whole cholesterol thing. 
you go to the doctor and you get a blood test done. It's a, usually called a lipid panel. And that's going to list a whole lot of things in there, such as your total cholesterol. Okay. And that's basically your, your good cholesterol plus your bad cholesterol. And it may contain or probably will contain your triglyceride levels. Triglycerides are just the fats that float around your bloodstream. It'll include your, your good cholesterol, your, it's also called HDL or high density lipoprotein. It's a fatty protein molecule. And usually it's called high density or good because you usually want to have a lot of good cholesterol in the body because that's supposed to help protect us against heart disease. And then the other lipoprotein that is going to be tested is bad cholesterol or LDL low density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, bad cholesterol, same thing. So when it comes to heart disease, you don't want to have a lot of LDL, bad cholesterol floating around your bloodstream. Higher levels of low density lipoprotein, too much bad cholesterol is bad for us. Okay. And this actually gets to something that, you know, is sometimes called the LDL hypothesis. The LDL hypothesis basically says this, the lower the LDL, the better. The lower the bad cholesterol level, the lower your chances of getting heart disease are. And there is evidence for this. And so, again, I call it the LDL hypothesis. Some people think that's kind of an outdated term. But regardless, a lot of the medications you see or have maybe have maybe take yourself for these statin medications, for instance, a lot of them are designed to lower bad cholesterol levels, not necessarily boost good cholesterol levels. The research is stronger for lowering the bad stuff in terms of keeping our heart healthy. So if you were to look on a blood test, you would see, for instance, you know, we talk about your total cholesterol, your triglycerides, your HDL, your LDL. And in general, if we're talking just total cholesterol levels, okay, um, you generally want to be less than about 200. If you're less than 200, they usually say you're, you're doing okay. Um, if your cholesterol level is like, you know, 240 or higher, that's considered really high. Okay. And in food for thought, those whose uh, their total cholesterol is greater than 240, they actually statistically have twice the risk of heart disease. So again, the higher the cholesterol, the greater the risk of heart disease. And that's why we want to try through various mechanisms, sometimes medications, but sometimes also through diet and exercise, and maybe some supplements to help lower cholesterol. When we talk of, of bad cholesterol, and that's really what I wanted to talk about, but the emphasis on today is that bad cholesterol. Generally, when you get your LDL, your bad cholesterol levels checked, less than 100 is where you want to aim for. So if you have, take a close look at some of your blood tests, you, you'll, they'll actually tell you if you're in the range or not. But less than 100 on LDL levels um, is kind of where you want to aim to be. And if you're on the high end, that's usually 160 or more. And depending on what your level is, a doctor may recommend maybe a, a statin medication to help you lower your cholesterol and your LDL levels. One problem, however, is that sometimes these statin medications may not work so well. And because of that, pharmaceutical companies have come up with a next generation, if you will, of cholesterol lowering medications. This next generation class of drugs are sometimes called PCSK9 inhibitors, PCSK9 inhibitors. One of these drugs, which you may have seen advertised on TV, is called Repatha. Repatha, I've seen that advertised on TV a lot. So that's the first thing, the first drug that comes to mind when I think about PCSK9 inhibitors. Sidebar, uh, I know there's people listening to me all over the world, and uh, I know while a, lot, a lot of you are in America, some of you might be in Germany and elsewhere. Um, so I, I wanted to just, I wanted to mention to you just to, just in passing that I mentioned that you know some of these drugs are advertised on TV. For those of you outside the country of America, you're probably saying, "What are you talking about, Joe?" So it turns out that only America and New Zealand allow drug companies to advertise drugs on television. For the rest of you out there on, you know, in, in the world, you're probably not going to see TV commercials for prescription medications. But for, for us and those in New Zealand, 
Yeah, we, we get bombarded with drugs, uh, drug advertisements. I, I, I can't even tell you how many times a day, uh, especially during primetime TV. I, we must see at least 20 advertisements for drugs every single day. And that's probably an understatement. But again, I just want to throw that out because I know the people listening to me and, you know, the, you know, in the UK and other countries and they, they're not getting those advertisements like we in America are. So again, if you ever comes up in jeopardy, you know, what are the only two countries that allow drug advertising? America and New Zealand. And you'd have the right answer. Oh, what is America and New Zealand? That would be the right answer for Jeopardy. So yet getting back on track, what the heck is PCSK9? Because that's really, I threw that out a second ago. And again, I, I don't want your head to spin by all this stuff. It is very complicated. So let me boil this down. PCSK9 is a protein. It's a protein that we make. And one of the things that it does is interferes with the receptors for bad cholesterol. In order to lower bad cholesterol levels, the bad cholesterol molecule must attach to the bad cholesterol receptor, which are mostly on liver cells. That's where the liver gets a lot of, does a lot of its work. Again, another reason why the liver never takes a break. The liver is always detoxifying us of bad cholesterol levels. And so for the bad cholesterol to be lowered, it's first got to attach to the LDL receptor. Well, it turns out that PCSK9 reduces the ability of those LDL receptors to work optimally. So the higher the PCSK9 level, the less well your bad cholesterol receptors can function. They don't work so well. So the more PCSK9 you make, the theoretically the, the, the worse your LDL levels might be. This means that anything that could lower or knock out your PCSK9 levels should make your bad cholesterol receptors work better at removing bad cholesterol from your bloodstream. And studies do in fact show that lowering PCSK9 levels can significantly lower LDL cholesterol levels in humans. I actually know somebody who is taking one of these medications, these, these, these PCSK9 injectable drugs. They are injectable. You inject them once or twice a week into the body with a teeny tiny needle. And they are very effective at lowering LDL levels. You remember a minute ago where I told you that on a blood test, uh, they normally want you to be less than 100 on, for bad cholesterol on a blood test. Uh, the person I know who is taking one of these medications, uh, his level went down to about 20. So they're very effective. And this is the reason why sometimes these injectable medications might be combined with, say, a orally taken statin medication. And the reason is, is that statins are a little weird in that they sometimes can actually raise PCSK9 levels. That's right. The, these Sometimes these cholesterol-lowering medications can actually raise a compound, PCSK9, which makes it harder for us to lower our bad cholesterol level. That's why sometimes statins may not work as well in some people and why these newer class of drugs were actually developed. The problem, however, with, at least right now with some of these, dr these drugs is that they're expensive. My goodness, they are usually going to cost, again, it depends on your insurance. And if you're, again, if you're in America, it would cost an insurance. But in America, the cost of some of these drugs could be about $1,000 a month. And that's a problem right there for a lot of people. Again, it depends on your insurance, obviously. You also have to inject them, which again, not a big needle, a little needle, but uh, uh, again, some people are, are adverse to injecting themselves. And I understand that. And then there is potentially another possibility of some of these injectable medications is that they may have some side effects. And the side effect that really called this home to me uh, a while ago was the person who I knew who was taking one of these medications uh, actually was suffering really bad muscle pains, which persisted for some time after he stopped taking them. And, and so that actually prompted me to actually write a review on that very drug. I'll link to that in the episode notes if you want to check out uh, that, that review. But again, that's something that I think some people may, may report. And again, other people have reported to me that they've had some side effects with these medications as well. 
So if you didn't want to take an injectable medication, is there a kinder, gentler PCSK9 inhibitor option that may be better for you? Like say, maybe a dietary supplement. Maybe. So in the remainder of our time this week, I just want to tell you about a few dietary supplements that are out there which have some evidence that they may lower this PCSK9 compound and also give you really what the research is about. And again, just because there's research doesn't necessarily mean it's right for you. So I want to try to put that research into context in the hopes that you'll better figure out if this is right for you. And then maybe even ask your doctor about it because, you know, this may be something that uh, maybe is on their radar as well and maybe they're considering. So let's talk about a few of these. The first dietary supplement that I want to bring your attention is called berberine. Berberine's been around for, my goodness, decades and decades. Um, it's it's actually a, a, an extract of various plants, like, like, for instance, Indian barberry and golden seal. It's actually been used in China for uh, since the 1950s, ironically, to treat diarrhea, which it does appear to do. But these days, at least in America, berberine has a reputation for uh, helping lower cholesterol levels. And also, and again, sidebar again, berberine also seems to do a pretty good job at lowering uh, blood sugar levels and as well, uh, even, even a- A1C levels, hemoglobin A1C levels. Uh, but that's a discussion for another time. Hemoglobin A1C is just a marker of how bad your diabetes is getting. It's essentially sugar-coated hemoglobin. But if we get back to berberine and say the cholesterol issues and the and the PCSK9 thing, so we've we've got basically some reviews of this. When I looked into this, I did find research on berberine as it pertains to lowering PCSK9 levels. One of the in one of these investigations, researchers gave berberine to mice who had high cholesterol levels. They observed that the berberine reduced PCSK9 levels in those mice by about 50%. And those mice, fortunately, also had lower bad cholesterol levels too. So it lowered their PCSK9 levels and also lowered their LDL levels too. Uh, There was another investigation where researchers uh, basically incubated uh, human liver cells in berberine, and they noted that the PCSK9 levels in those cells dropped by about 90%. Very interesting, uh, but again, we're not rats and we're certainly not isolated cells in a Petri dish. So again, we really need more better and larger human studies to figure out what's going on. There was one study that I did come up with as I was investigating this. It is a human trial. It it basically had a large number of people and they, you know, over almost 300 individuals in this study. And they basically split them up into groups. The people either took a, a statin medication or they took a dietary supplement containing either 500 milligrams of berberine, 10 milligrams of polycosinol, or and oh, excuse me, and 200 milligrams of red yeast rice. They followed them for three months. And they noted that in those people who took the supplements, uh, the LDL level went down by about 10%. So the supplements lowered lowered the bad cholesterol level by about 10%. And they attributed in the study, they did attribute this to reductions in the PCSK9 protein. Again, I, I actually did read the study. Uh, the problem, however, was they, unfortunately, they didn't measure the PCSK9 levels. And that's a problem. And then the other issue I have with the study is red yeast rice will lower cholesterol levels and lower LDL levels. So it's kind of hard to tell whether this particular effect you saw was due to the the berberine, the red yeast rice, or the polycosinol, or all of them. And so that's an issue for that study. So I can't find yet a whole lot of research on people out there. In fact, I don't really see a lot at all. So most of the research appears to be limited for the most part to isolated cell studies and individual laboratory animals, you know, for now. So Berberine gets a lot of attention as a natural PCSK9 inhibitor. It has a lot of very interesting research that it can help lower, uh, again, bad cholesterol levels, triglyceride levels, maybe even bolster uh, good cholesterol levels. PCSK9 inhibition is one proposed mechanism that it appears to work. And the research on, again, laboratory animals and, and isolated cells seem to show that it is doing this. I would just like to see some human research to back that up. Now, if I leave the berberine alone for a little bit, 
let's focus on the next supplement that I want to bring your attention. And that's curcumin. Curcumin is, is a, basically an extract of turmeric. Turmeric is a spice that very well may be in your kitchen right now. It's important to realize that both turmeric and curcumin both have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, and both have a truckload of research on them for pretty much everything you can imagine, you know, arthritis, diabetes, depression, you know, the list goes on and on and on. But what about lowering of cholesterol levels, lowering of bad cholesterol levels? Can curcumin or turmeric do that? Well, there are some studies on this, although be honest with you, I wish there were more. I wish there were more studies. I wish there were more human studies. I've seen research out there that, again, I'll link to in the episode notes where, you know, taking about a gram of turmeric could lower total cholesterol and bad cholesterol levels, you know, after several months of use. Other studies have noted that turmeric might boost good cholesterol levels and lower triglyceride levels, you know, but again, it's, it's not something that I see a lot of human research on. And that's why I'm a little hesitant to use that as a first run therapy to lower triglycerides and cholesterol and LDL. Oh, and, and again, another sidebar, if you're taking turmeric or using the spice or curcumin, it's possible that, uh, especially as a dietary supplement, that it comes packaged with black pepper. And that the reason for that is, is that turmeric, both turmeric and curcumin are not very well absorbed in the body. And so when it comes to dietary supplements, one way they get around this really poor absorbability is they'll combine it with black pepper. Black pepper activates an enzyme that's involved in the metabolism and breakdown of these products. And so it, it increases the absorption of turmeric and curcumin a lot. And that's why a lot of dietary supplements do that. If you don't like pepper, and, and who doesn't? I mean, I actually love it, but I know some people may not. But another way to overcome this obstacle is just take it with some fat. So if you, you know, had a little bit of fat in your meal and you sprinkled some, you know, some, some turmeric or some curcumin on your meal, the fat will also increase the absorption as well. Just something I want to throw out to you because occasionally people ask me, you know, why does curcumin and turmeric come prepackaged with black pepper? And it's just to drastically increase the absorption, again, to get around the relatively poor uh, absorption that we tend to have. Again, another sidebar, you know, I like to do sidebars, as you know. Uh, not always better absorption means better acting, just so you know. Um, there are some downsides to being very well absorbed. So don't take Take things to extremes and take a whole lot of this stuff and sprinkle on a whole lot of black pepper in the hopes that you're going to absorb a whole lot of it. You know, sometimes a little goes a long way when it comes to turmeric and curcumin, but I just want to throw that out to you. I'll most likely do a podcast episode on just turmeric and curcumin uh, in the future. So stay tuned for that. But that's just a little sidebar I wanted to throw your way. In terms of PCSK9, because that's where I really want to keep the focus for this week, does, does turmeric or, 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 or curcumin lower PCSK9 levels? And to that, I would say the preliminary research out there right now says it, it might. Uh, I have, when I looked at the research, I did notice some, again, preliminary research. We're basically, again, here talking about uh, cell studies where, you know, basically they would incubate cells in curcumin or turmeric, and they noted that there were drops, dec declines, if you will, in the PCS K9 levels. That's interesting, but again, I'm always going to want to come back to human studies because we're we're much more complicated than isolated cells in a Petri dish. But there is some preliminary evidence on this. For the most part, I really think we need more research out there. Oh, and again, another sidebar, it is interesting that most of the research out there on, on this topic involves turmeric and not curcumin itself. Remember that curcumin is an extract, if you will, of turmeric. I personally think turmeric is a better choice overall because it's a more broad spectrum nutrient. Curcumin is basically, you know, one aspect of the spice. So it, I leave it to your your devices, what you think is best for you. But I personally think turmeric is more powerful than curcumin. Although I cannot deny curcumin does have research on a wide array of topics. Um, when it does, when it overall, when it comes to um, anything, I'm usually going to go to the turmeric first. 
Another supplement that potentially might help reduce PCSK9 levels is transresveratrol. Transresveratrol. That's probably how it's going to be uh, listed in a dietary supplement. Sometimes it goes by the names Japanese knotweed or polydatin. Polydatin. Either way, we're talking about transresveratrol. If you like to eat the foods that contain this stuff. I just like to throw out to you that, you know, you can get this as a dietary supplement. Absolutely, you can. It's all over the place. But again, if you like peanuts, grapes, pistachios, uh, blueberries, cranberries, dark chocolate, uh, even red and white wine uh, does contain small amounts of resveratrol. So you can get this from food, not just dietary supplements. But again, I think a lot of people listen to me may be taking this as a dietary supplement. So uh, again, it is it has been around a thousand years you know, and so you can get it pretty much everywhere. But as for lowering PCSK9 levels, can it do this? Can it help lower heart disease risk by lowering PCSK9 levels? Well, there there are a few studies out there, uh, but again, I do believe the research is highly preliminary. Uh, what I saw again uh, on on resveratrol lowering PCSK9 levels was limited to again isolated cells. You, you basically you know drip the resveratrol on the cell and you measure the PCSK9 levels, again, that's, that's very different than when you take it orally as a dietary supplement. So I'm not convinced resveratrol is ready for prime time as a, as a natural PCSK9 inhibitor. But again, I wanted to mention it because if you were delving into this research, you would probably see some studies talking about it, but the research is highly preliminary at this, at this time. And then the next supplement that I just wanted to bring your attention is something that my th- my thinking is is that many of you may already be taking, and that's fish oil. When I when I give seminars on dietary supplements, I usually ask people what supplements they're taking, and nine times out of ten, fish oil is the one supplement that pretty much everybody seems to be taking. Like a lot of supplements out there, even like turmeric, there's a lot of research on it for a variety of different reasons. But when it comes to lowering PCSK9 levels, I did observe two human trials. Again, I'll put them in the episode links uh, so you can check them out for yourself. And basically, they did look at PCSK9 levels in conjunction with fish oil supplementation. I would like to see more than just two studies out there, and I think the studies have some problems, although I can appreciate that they are involving humans. One investigation uh, noted that omega-3 fatty acids, these are the fish oils we're talking about, the EPA and DHA, uh, appeared to lower PCSK9 levels in women by about 10%. Interestingly, though, it didn't, however, appear to lower bad cholesterol levels. Remember, PCSK9, if you lower that, in theory, your LDL bad cholesterol should go down. In that study, it didn't seem to. And for me, I wondered why. Could be the fact that we're in this study, they looked at pre and postmenopausal women. That could have been an issue. It could also be maybe there weren't enough people in the study. They may have not used enough. It's hard to say. Uh, but again, well, I did see two human studies on this topic uh, of fish oils for lowering PCSK9 levels. I would like to see a few more, and and that would give me much more faith. But at the moment, um, I would say it's hard it's hard to say if it works or not. But you know, fish oil has a lot of different benefits in the body. I mean, it, it, it may help depression levels, and people sometimes people swear to me it helps arthritis pain, etc. So you know, I have no problem with fish oil, except that you know when it comes to PCSK9, like a lot of things we're talking about today. A lot of it is is experimental at this stage of the game. And before we, you know, end, I, I, I can't really leave this topic before talking about the elephant in the room that maybe you're wondering about. You're probably saying, you know, Joe, you're talking in supplements. Well, what about exercise? What about diet? Is You know, can these things lower PCSK9 levels and lower our cholesterol levels too? What I can say right now is that the writing on the wall suggests maybe There is some evidence that both the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean style eating program, as well as intermittent fasting may lower PCSK9 levels. And again, it's preliminary. It's intriguing. The writing on the wall is very intriguing, but I think it's preliminary at best. And as for exercise so far... I'm not convinced yet. The research on the exercise is, again, mostly limited to laboratory animals. Again, that's an issue for me, as you as you know, I've said it a thousand times. But 
I'm not so worried about whether or not eating the Mediterranean diet or fasting or exercise lowers PCSK9 levels, generally speaking, because especially when it comes to the Mediterranean diet and exercise, there's a tremendous amount of research that both of these interventions, if you call them interventions, I call them lifestyle changes, are very, very healthy. You, you can't do wrong, generally speaking, by moving more and eating a, a more colorful diet. The research is really overwhelming when it comes to this. So whether or not it lowers the PCSK9 levels I think is kind of arbitrary at this moment in time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't stop exercising or eating the Mediterranean diet because, you know, oh, Joe said we're not sure yet. There's a whole lot of benefits to moving more and eating better. Uh, they go far beyond what we're talking about here. But I, I just wanted to throw it out to you that, yeah, there is some evidence that Mediterranean, you, you might chalk this up to another one of its long list of, uh, of good points and exercise. Maybe it will. It's hard to say at this moment in time. It may depend on the intensity of exercise. It may depend on the length of time you do the exercise. It's hard to say at this point. Uh, again, I'm, I've, I've got my feelers out for research on this. So when more research on this topic uh, does come out, I'm going to do future uh, podcasts on this. So keep you in, informed. But that's the kind of the lay of the land right now. So whether or not there is a natural way to lower your PCSK9 levels, to lower your bad cholesterol level, um, I, I think there is some very intriguing writing on the wall. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say don't do any of this stuff because, you know, if you're struggling with your, having elevated bad cholesterol levels and maybe you don't want to take a medication, maybe you're afraid to for whatever reason, maybe throw this out to your doctor. Maybe say, you know, hey, doc, I've heard that maybe there are some supplements out there that may help lower that PCSK9 levels, uh, like maybe berberine or fish oil. You know, how about, you know, what do you think if I try this for a couple of months and see what happens? You know, have a conversation with your doctors, see what they got to think about this. Uh, I, I got to think they'd be, I got to think they'd be very happy to have a conversation with, with an engaged patient who is making their health a priority. I got to think that as a physician, it gets kind of, daunting sometimes to deal with patients who, you know, just want to take a pill and, you know, hope for the best. And sometimes always taking a pill doesn't, doesn't give you the outcome you think. You know, anything, any strategy you use, whether it's, you know, taking a pill, doing some kind of injection, like, like one of these drugs we're talking about today, um, I, I got to think all these things work better when you take a more informed approach to your lifestyle. And so, you know, bring this up to your doctor. Again, berberine, fish oil, uh, maybe curcumin. A lot of these things are pretty innocuous as, as supplements go. Um, and again, they may help. Again, the only way to really know is to test them, to take them into the lab and test them. And right now, we're just not there yet. My hope, however, one of the hopes I have for doing this podcast is, is that somebody out there is listening to me, maybe a graduate student, hint, hint, wink, wink, grad students, maybe this would be a topic for you to do a dissertation on and you'd get published. This is a great topic that is wide open for research because these drugs are out there and they're being heavily marketed on television. And again, if there was a kinder, gentler way of doing this, um, that, that is less expensive, this may be an attractive option for people. Hopefully you took something of merit from this. If anything, you now know what PCSK9 is. That's the word of the day, PCSK9. Again, it is it is a, it's an intriguing topic that I think is is burgeoning for is burgeoning in medical research, but I think in the world of dietary supplements and health and wellness, this is something that I think people need to uh, investigate more. So hopefully that's going to happen. But again, at the end of the day, realize that biology is complicated, and I do think being healthy does boil down to more than just lowering PCSK9 levels. And that's why I wanted to mention the, the diet and exercise aspect at the end of this episode. Because again, we, we, we've fallen victim to this before. You put all your emphasis on one, one thing. You put all your eggs in you know, the resveratrol basket, or in this case, the PCSK9 basket. I think being healthy and being well is much bigger than just one thing. And so if you've heard about this and you, know, you want to try to lower your levels naturally, you know, through some of these things we've talked about today, that's great. There are more power to you. But I also think that the at the end of the day, it really comes down to a more holistic approach, which again means eating better and moving more. And if you do that, I think at the end of the day, you're going to be all right. So 
What do you think, gang? Have you tried any of these things? What do you what do you what do you think about all this PCSK9 stuff? I know it's it's it, it's very new for some people, but uh, this is actually born out of a qu- another question that I was asked recently, which you know took me down the rabbit hole recently this week. I actually did a did a review on uh, on berberine as it lowers uh, PCSK9 levels, which I'll link to in the review. But uh, let me know what you think about all this. Uh, I'm I'm curious, and again, I'll be keeping my 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 ears and my eyes open for more research, specifically human research, and when it comes out, I'll definitely let you know about it. And that brings this episode to a close. Holy mackerel, we've gone actually longer than I thought. I thought this would actually be a pretty quick, quick, quick episode this week, but well, as it turns out, I like to talk and, uh, you know, this episode definitely proved that. So I'm going to leave you this week with the quote of the day. And it comes to us from the one and only Tony Robbins, who said, persistence overshadows even talent as the most valuable resource shaping the quality of our lives. Pretty good words. That's why he's Tony Robbins. That's all I got for you this week, gang. So until next week, same time, same bad channel. I'm Joe Cannon. Go out, be safe, and where you can, do try to make a difference.